Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords, and today I'm here to do a review of Warriors of the Red Planet, an OSR rule set for fantastic adventures set on other planets, <laughs> uh, written by Al Kromach and Thomas Denmark, and published by Night Owl Workshop. I'll get into that in a moment, but first, uh, programming note, this Sunday we should be having another episode of Inappropriate Characters, Technicalities Permitting. <laughs> you never really know. There can always be technical errors. Um, and it should be, I believe, guest starring the basic expert. But uh, don't 100% count on me on that yet because, uh, you know, I don't know if he's reconfirmed. Um, and Job's doing some vacationing, I think, or something. So that, that, that might complicate things. But keep your eyes open on Sunday. Take a look. Uh, I'll send a post to the, you know, like a community post here on YouTube. I'll be posting on my social media. Uh, odds are that we will be having an inappropriate characters episode. All right. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so let's get let's get on here to the the review. So uh, we've done several reviews recently of these Night Owl Workshop books, and they're all quite good uh, so far, you know, Um some of them I've liked a little more than others. Um, they're, they're not without occasional errors, uh, you know, like typos and things like that, um, or areas where the rules could be more clear. But on the whole, they're they're pretty good fun. And, and so, you know, there are certain things that are naturally good, even though the OSR can do all kinds of things, right? Like from super medieval authentic stuff, like the adventures that you see in the medieval authentic, the old school companion 2, uh, to like modern day occult role playing in the Invisible College, to like wacky Gonzo weird m fantasy stuff in World of the Last Sun. Um, it's you know sci fi like in Star Adventure. It's wide open, but uh, there are a few genres which tend to be more natural for it than others. So, for example, the another book these guys did was the one about superheroes i think it was called guardians uh, the, the review is in is is, is uh, on my youtube channel check it out in the reviews playlist is where you get all of the reviews of all the role-playing books i've been reviewing um and you know that one didn't feel quite so natural to the genre but like the sword and planet genre you know the genre of john carter of mars and all that is a direct ancestor let's say of the genres of D D. Right. So like it's it links itself with sword and sorcery. It's linked with like um, the kind of weird fantasy, you know, so it's a natural, you know, it's something that naturally fits the D&D &D structure. It would be hard for them to get this wrong. The, the real question is, how good is it compared to, say, other possibilities? So. As usual, I don't have I, – I can't put this on a podium because then I, I can't have this lying down, right? I can't put my camera on a podium. So, you know, I don't know what to do about it. I need like some kind of weird device that goes around my neck and <laughs> the camera just hangs there so then I can use both my hands. I don't know if such a thing exists or not like or, – or some kind of weird hat, you know, and then the camera hangs over it. It doesn't help that my, you know, my phone is a pretty heavy phone. So I, I don't think I could just like put it on a, like a piece of, of – you know, uh, I don't know, on a, on a, on a cardboard or something and, and that it would stick around. I think this would just be more complicated than is necessary. Anyway, um, this is an OSR game, right? So if you don't know what an OSR game is, check out all of the, um, well, all the other reviews I've done so far. And, and, there, and the video that is early on in, in my YouTube channel called uh, The OSR is Cutting Edge. And that'll explain to you, but basically it's, RPGs that are derived from D&D, but altered to fit specific genres, um, all based on old school d and It's a design movement. And um, so here we start with the, you know, character creation standard races. So you have the ancients, which are remaining people of super civilizations. Um, the elevated, who are like uplifted animals, exotics, which are just weirdos humans <laughs> and the unliving which are not undead they're just like like uh, artificial life forms right um so these these races are all fine um 
they they make some important alterations but the interesting thing is that you're always kind of like gambling if you're doing it with the 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 non humans plus this uh this product uses well, this product uses level limits right so um like the ancients are are good as scientists or mentalists but as fighting men or scoundrel they're they they can't go higher than 6 level which is not that that high right um exotics have random roles so they may or may not get what you want um humans can just are just the neutral ones they can add a plus 1 to one ability score of your choosing uh but they have no level, level limits right so ultimately humans are the most powerful that's something that that modern D loses out on and then suddenly it make, means that humans tend to be the least useful race right <laughs> um character class so the first one is the fighting man and there's you know the ripoff of like a cross between he-man and john carter of mars <laughs> uh, which let's face it he-man is kind of sword and planet too actually as you can see they're using kind of standard xp tables standard hit dice uh hit bonuses they even have the titles hit dice d10 um scoundrels are people who survive through cunning and basically they're thieves like uh, most of the products that night owl has done they try as much as possible to just directly for want of a better term rip off um D D, the structure of D D. so like even even guardians you get you know it was like the classes and their abilities and, and stuff it felt like um like they were still trying to do it as much as D&D as possible. So obviously here they're just using the same classes, very slight different differences, but, but very slight ones um, because that's what they want to do. So then they have the mentalist. Um, the mentalist is like um, psychic, but his, his powers work basically like spells. So you get a number of um, powers, and then you can use only a certain number of those powers, a certain amount of those powers per day, um, because I guess it's it's meant to be taxing, perhaps. Um, and uh, mentalists can even unlearn powers and gain new ones, and that that's all fine. Then, but then you have the scientist. This is the one that bugs me a little bit, because. You know, they had to have a, a weird science guy. And this is one of the problems, genre problems, right? The weird science guy, um, he has gadgetry, right? And so he makes gadgets too. But so for for no reason whatsoever, every single gadget he has can only like do one charge, right? It can only do one thing. It has one action per day. Like it was a spell. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wonder why they did it that way, you know? So obviously this is, again, meant to be, you know, the wizard cleric type of, of class, um, but the problem is that, that just doesn't, you know, they have chosen mechanics over credibility in a setting, right? I mean, like, why would there be a gad? Like, it's one thing if you're a scientist, like, if the, why would there be a scientist that all they do ever is make gadgets that have one use per day? Unless all, uh, you're living in a world where all technology only has one use per day, right? <laughs> Something like that. I don't know why that would be, even even so, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's just bizarre, right? Like, I mean, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it breaks verisimilitude in the setting. And I think if, if you were going to do, here's a place where if you were going to do a class that was like the scientist, you need to rework this and do something different and not just make him try to be like, like a cleric ripoff, but instead of spells, he has, he has, you know, um, artifacts, it's it's not sensible. Um, equipment stuff is pretty basic. Um, the mentalist powers, as you can see, a lot of mentalist powers are basically stuff directly from like D and D spells or psionics. And scientist gadgets. Uh, so you see that a lot of these again, you know. Um, a flamethrower. Oh, it it releases uh, a, a burst of fire that does one d four damage plus one hit per point of hit point per level of the scientist. That's down here, right? So it's like literally uh, what is it? Flaming hands, right? 
um, except it's a flamethrower. There's and and there's no justification for it, right? Like, why in the world would the like if I would get it if you like if it's one point one hit point per level of the scientist at the time he made the gadget, right? Because maybe that was like how good the scientist was there. But why would, as he goes up in level, why does his gadget with no other intervention suddenly become better, you know? <laughs> and the lens, oh, this is an interpreter lens. It lets you read languages, right? So they're just like, you know, directly doing ripoffs of the D&D magic system and may, trying to justify them as gadgets. Um, now, again, this is my biggest pet peeve of this book. Otherwise, I think the book is really quite good, right? But the, it really just drives me nuts, right? Because I went all the way that in, like, Invisible College and in Lion and Dragon, I just threw out the entire magic system of D&D. Like, the Vancian magic is gone, and what you have in there is a completely different um, system of magic with a different mechanic of how you resolve it. The magic was was meant to be authentic magic. Like, in Lion and Dragon, it is magic that looks the way people in the setting understood magic to be, right? That is to say, the setting being 15th century Europe. And in Invisible College, it's magic the way modern occultists imagine magic to be, right? And and so I chose verisimilitude over tradition, right? Not, I hope, over playability, because I think the system is still very playable, but obviously it means that a wizard, uh, that is to say a magister in Lion and Dragon, is very, very different from a magister, or sorry, from a wizard in D&D. Uh, th- because he's not he's not going to have spells that he has to memorize, but he's also not going to have, you know, be spell casting. He doesn't have like three le- first level, three second, three third level spells. Uh, what he has is uh, a number of techniques that he's learned, almost all of which are ritual type magic, which means he, he's not going to be a you know, unlike in D&D, the Magister in Lion and Dragon is very rarely going to be a huge um, instant action combat guy on the ground, right? That there, There's very little magic that you can just cast in the middle of a fight, right? You have to come prepared. So guess what? He's kind of a gadgeteer, but except his gadgets make sense in the context of medieval, you know, magical lore. So, uh, you know, I just think that it this is this kind of like, it's exactly the same, just with the number, the names changed scenario. Um, it's not necessarily bad if it was, you know, if it wasn't a, if you weren't saying this guy's a, a scientist, right? Like the mentalist isn't bad. The mentalist is is not surprising in any way, but he's not bad, right? This is bad because you're supposed, you know, you're you're translating a mechanic that might work with magic, but here you're applying it to technology and there just doesn't work with technology. There's no such thing as a, as a one, you know, a one use item that then recharges and you can use it again the next day. And that becomes better as you get better without having any kind of enhancements done to, you know, like that just doesn't work. So uh, that, that sort of thing annoys me. Um, Anyways, here you have the section for adventuring and it gives you lots of details about like, well, uh, enough details anyways, to, to uh, explain about like, you know, you're talking about, you know, this is like basically John Carter sort of stuff, right? So alien cities and uh, deserts and underground pits, uh, um, some basic mechanics. Again, here, none of these mechanics are going to be really surprising because they're all very much following kind of the, the tradition of D&D, hirelings, combat. Um, there are, aren't any important surprises here. They have, you know, both options for both ascending and descending armor class, which is, I think at this point, quaint. I think most OS, newer, newer OSR books use ascending, but uh, I guess there are exceptions. Uh, experience uh, uh, points, so experience is for achieving goals, getting treasure, killing monsters, and they make a pretty simple system of accumulating it. Oh, it's a meatball. Hey, meatball. What's, go- what's, what's going on there, meatball? Are you gonna get into my books here? Are you getting? Are you gonna get in my face? <laughs> Damn it, meatball! I knew it. What's up? Meow. Yeah. You're being very noisy today. What's going on? What? Yeah, really. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think you got to get off of here. Do you think you can get off? How about you? Can you can you come onto my lap or something? <laughs> this is futile. Oh no! Oh, there she goes. Okay, good. See you later, meatball. <laughs> hey, she actually. <laughs> She actually understood. 
it only took 12 years. <laughs> so uh, combat charts, they have m- multiple ways to handle AC. So ascending AC, descending AC, and different ways to handle combat. So you could just roll with bonuses against a number, or you have basically Thaco saving throws. Nothing special there. Uh, adventure design, you got uh, details on tone, scope, you know, how to make the sword and planet genre. Um, none of which is like super important basically unless you really have no idea about certain planet genre but then why would you be buying this book um the monster section has a variety of monsters um which are appropriately sword and planet it is a fine line between like sword and planet and weird fantasy on the one hand and like traditional fantasy and sci-fi like it's just a, a strange mix of stuff right um because it's not meant to be weird fantasy or gonzo exactly but it can get pretty weird, right? <laughs> and I think they do a good job here. You know, like the um, you've got the different types of uh, alien humans. You know, uh, the like Red Princess of Mars. You know, that sort of thing. Slave girls too. <laughs> so no, no political correctness here, um, and that's good. Quite a large section on combat. And then we get to like the races of Mars. Like this is like optional stuff because like there's not – technically there's not a, a default setting here, right? Like there's an assumed setting in the context of play of like uh, – of the of the context of rules rather that are suggesting the type of world that this game is made for. But it doesn't come with a full-blown setting. But it does come with like – some some lore for like if you wanted to do something that was very kind of martian classic right so it talks about the different races of mars um and then like but you can see it's just like four pages right and then you got some nice random tables here for random encounters for all that big monster section um random flora and then you have like random names random ruins um weird science See, okay, like weird science, I can accept that as being like almost magical, right? But if you've got a literal gadgeteer, like a Victorian style gadgeteer or whatever, he's not going to be making one use items, you know, and then but one use rechargeable items, which improve. Okay, anyways, I've said enough of that. Um, you got another appendix where you have as an optional class, the sorcerer, right? Like I would have said, I mean, okay, yes, Sword and Planet does not always have sorcerers, you know, and um, usually it's implied that when there are, that they were actually like what they're doing is actually some kind of super super science that's that looks indistinguishable from magic. Um, but I would have suggested that you know the sorcerer could be a, a default class, whereas the gadgeteer, you know, or the scientist rather, uh, the scientist could be an NPC class, right? So there there wouldn't be that would that would at least have helped, you know. Although what would really have helped was them to have like. To, to, to come up with a better way of doing gadgetry than to just use that to just say, well, it's just like spells and then na na na, I can't hear you, right? Like there's, <laughs> yeah, just ignore the fact that it makes no sense. Yeah. Very stupid. Um, anyways, the, the, the sorcerer is good. He's like, you know, sorcerers are being in this sort of setting are always like at the very least tempting evil. So it's a, kind of darker sorcerer and it's fine you know there's some rules optional rules on using skills and then some ship versus ship combat which has some rules for aerial battles now uh i don't think this is as detailed a set of rules as what you get in the combat system uh, for sky ships in world of the last sun which people might want to use instead <laughs> if they uh if they ever get like they could get this man like i could totally see somebody getting this book and it, wanting to like have a slightly weirded up version of Sword and Fa- Planet Fantasy and getting World of the Last Sun. And, you know, you got the sky ships and everything. These are nice looking designs anyways. Um, that would have, you know, that would those would go very well together. That's one of the advantages of the OSR is that you can p- take books. I mean, you could max. These three books are all very, very different genres. So it would be strange, but theoretically, you could like mix them all together. Right? Like you could be having adventures from this one being run with the rule book from this one and with like magic and things from this one. You know, that that would be completely doable because that's the OSR. 
um, suggested reading. It's pretty obvious what we're looking at here. Mars, 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 Venus, 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 Venus from Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, and then a few other guys here. Uh, Gore, you know, like these are, it's the classic. This is all a, a fairly detailed bibliography of classic sword and planet stuff. And here's ancient Mars, Mars underworld. Um, I would say that on the whole, this is a perfectly good game. Uh, you can use it quite effectively, I think, for Sword and Planet. It's I, I couldn't think of a better version of Sword and Planet, really, than this one. Um, very playable. I don't remember how much this costs, but I'm guessing it doesn't cost a lot. I'll have the link in the description below, um, if I assuming I can find the link. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it, so it's it's a fun game. My only complaint is the is the 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 scientist class, right? Other than that, uh, I think it's perfectly good D and D, and it's perfectly good um, setting work. You know, uh, just wish they hadn't lazied up on the on the tech. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of their their style, right? It's like they're like, damn it, we're not going to we're not going to innovate in any special way. What what we're just going to do is like find a mechanic from D and D shave off the uh the serial number and rebrand it even if it makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> but luckily in this case as opposed to some of their other books um the genre is so close to what you want from D D anyways you know like from what works at D that uh it works it works anyways you just get rid of that gadgeteer and replace it with something else and you're good to go so that's everything for today if you like this video please share it Share it anywhere you think people will find it interesting. Um, I usually say share it where it'll piss people off. I, I don't see how this review is likely to piss anyone off, except maybe that, you know, the slave women, that might piss someone off. <laughs> and uh, if you want to support me, check out my products, right? Stuff like The Invisible College, like The Old School Companion 2, World of the Last Sun, uh, Lion and Dragon. If you don't have a lot of money, um, but you've got a few bucks and you want to get something good for your gaming, like, you know, uh, check out... RPG Pundit Presents, the PDF series. The link is in the description again. All the links are in the description. <laughs> and uh, that's 107 different uh, source books, adventures, or uh, other types of, you know, like monster books or, or uh, magic items or all kinds of stuff that you can use in a variety of OSR games. They all cost somewhere between 99 cents and like $4.99. So it's like you're buying me a coffee or well, in some cases like you're buying me a gum basically <laughs> but you're getting something back for yourself right you're you're getting you're giving me some cash but you're also getting something for yourself if you really don't want to get anything for yourself you can always support me on patreon like if you've bought every single product that i've made or you just have zero interest in buying my products but you otherwise like i don't know you like my pipe enthusiasm or my you know uh, li cultural libertarian conservative politics or whatever it is, whatever reason you like the cut of my gym, uh, and feel free to support me on Patreon if not. Uh, but mainly, <coughs> like and share the video. And uh, I guess that's everything for today. Currently smoking a uh, Lorenzetti Horn plus Argento Natural.